going to continue working through our series in the book of Romans. If you'd like to turn with me, we're going to be at Romans chapter 12 this evening. And uh, last week, if you remember, we took just verses 1 to 8, and then I said that this week we, Lord willing, would be doing 9 to the end of the chapter. And just to kind of remind us what's been going on in this book. So this is written by the Apostle Paul to the house churches in Rome, and these are two new Christian converts that Paul has never actually met before. And he's heard about their faith, and he just wants to ensure that they have an understanding of the Christian fundamentals, um, specifically looking at the gospel. So he's giving them an in-depth teaching about what the gospel is, that they would, he would ensure that they would get the gospel right. And so for the first really 11 chapters, it's been him giving theology or doctrine. He's basically been explaining this doctrine, which is known as justification by faith alone. Or that is to say that we are declared righteous simply by trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. So he's been making that case that we are justified or saved or or declared righteous by trusting in Jesus. Well, now chapter 12 is the transition chapter where now we're going to be looking at the rest of the book, but it's going to move from our learning into actually our living. So we're going to actually start to apply now. So this is actually how we start to um, have applications because what Paul shows us in this chapter is that there are actually implications for the gospel, right? So it's not just you, you hear the good news of the gospel and then you say, awesome, I got this great news and now I'm just going to internalize it and do nothing with it. Rather, once we understand and hear the gospel, we're actually called to live it out, share it with others, and, and it should actually transform our lives. And so what we saw then in chapter 12 and verses 1 to 8 is Paul said, because of the mercies that he's been explaining for the first 11 chapters. So because of all of these mercies that God has bestowed and given to us, because of redemption, right, because of forgiveness, because we've been adopted as sons, we've um, been, in, given, uh, been given the kingdom of heaven, he said because of all of these mercies that God has given us, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by these mercies, that you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So he's saying because of what we Understand by the gospel message, because of the good news of salvation, we are to give ourselves to God as living sacrifices, which means we're supposed to give our entire lives to God. It's supposed to give God glory through what we do, and it's supposed to be an, um, a holy and an acceptable sacrifice, right? So we kind of explained the sacrificial system and what was significant about that, and we also explained how the sacrifice, it needs to be holy, meaning set apart, Right? And it also needs to be acceptable. It means God actually has to enjoy what you're giving him. Not just say, oh, here's my sacrifice, God. You need to accept it. No, God will not accept certain types of sacrifices. So if we live a life that doesn't honor God, then he's not going to accept that type of sacrifice. So he then goes on to then show how this directly applies to how we relate to one another. So if you just think of the very beginning of chapter 12 as our relationship to God, You can now think of really the rest of the chapter of how that relationship is going to affect our relationship with one another, right? So if you have a good relationship with God, right, if you're living for God, then you're going to see how it... Good, uh, how there's a positive impact in your relationships. But if you notice how you, if you have a distant relationship from God and if you're not living for him, you're going to see how it also negatively can affect and impact your relationships. And so what we looked at uh, in verses three to eight is how we as Christians have been given because of the gospel. We've actually been given spiritual gifts. We've all been gifted in unique ways and we are called to um, exercise those gifts within the body to build one another up and to make one another more and more mature, more and more like Christ. And so we kind of just stopped there with just that call for us to um, be more um, intentional with not only discerning what gifts God has given us, because each Christian has been given something unique to the body, but also that we are actually trying to intentionally exercise it within the body. So now what we're going to do for verses 9 to 21 is we're going to see now how um, we are to really just live this life out, not only within the church, but also in the world. So how we are to relate to, to Christians, but also to the unsaved, those who don't know Christ. And so that's what 9 to 21 is really going to be, be looking at. And if you um, have your Bibles with you, you might have headings in your Bible. And, and some of your headings might say something like, behave like a Christian, or maybe marks of a true Christian, maybe something like that if you have some, some headings in your Bible. And I think that it's important that that's kind of what this focus is going to be about, right? 
to actually live out the Christian life, right? To apply it, um, to have the true marks of what it means to be a Christian. And I think it's so important that when we call ourselves Christians, we, we have to remember where that comes from. It's not just an arbitrary name that we give ourselves, right? We didn't just give ourselves like a team name and say, we're the Christians, right? Christian literally means that we are followers of Christ. So when we're saying behave like a Christian or, or the true marks of a Christian, what we're really saying is, live like Christ. And so really that's going to be kind of my encouragement or exhortation for us this evening is that is we are to live like Christ, live like Jesus. And I think that you can really almost break this um, rest of the chapter up into really just two sections. And uh, verses 9 to 13, what I'm going to kind of call this section is we are to love like Christ or love like Jesus. And then verses 14 to 21, I think we are to make peace like Christ or make peace like Jesus. So So with that being said, let us just now read the text, uh, verses 9 to 21 of chapter 12. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, Continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it is possible, as much as depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, You will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, really, if you see in this, um, you know, second half of this chapter, you notice how many like exhortations Paul's giving. Right? Really, you can almost take each of these, and it almost looks like the Book of Proverbs, right? Where it's almost like you're getting a lot of these little small sayings that are like, apply this, apply this. This is what it looks like to, to live a, a wise life, a life that would honor God, right? And, but as I said, I think that though there are these, a lot of these different thought processes of how we are to live, I think that you can kind of categorize them somewhat to where he actually does kind of have a, an overall flow of what he's saying. And as I said, I, I, I think that you can kind of see it in first, um, the first half is kind of really focusing on what true love looks like, what biblical godly love is. And so that's what I first want us to, to key in on. So if you just look at verse 9, he starts this section of, of how it is to live like Christ, and he says, let love be without hypocrisy. That's how he starts it out, right? Let love be without hypocrisy. And so what, what that means, to be without hypocrisy, he's saying that we must manifest a love that is genuine, that is sincere, and is authentic, right? If you remember when Jesus was on the earth, one of the, the biggest issues that he had with his you know, skeptics and, and the, the critics was the religious leader's hypocrisy, right? To be a hypocrite, literally what that word would mean, it would be to be like an actor on a stage wearing a mask, right? So you're, you're performing something. You're not who you say you are, right? You're, you're putting on a mask that's it's like putting on a front. And he's saying that that is one of the greatest things that caused Jesus anger, right? He, he did not like hypocrisy. And so now what Paul is emphasizing here is we are actually called to have a love for others, but we're not supposed to have a, a hypocritical love. Rather, it needs to be a genuine, authentic love that we know can come through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when we receive Christ, he gives us a new heart, so he gives us the tools, the abilities to have an authentic love. But, so he's wanting us to ensure that we, we, are, we are cultivating and manifesting a, a, an authentic love for others. And I think that it's important that as we seek to grow in grace, right, and as we're thinking about trying to be more like Christ, we, we need to think about what, it, what that looks like. So that means that we need to think like Jesus, right? 
To love like Jesus is to think like Jesus. And we also need to love what Jesus loves, and then we need to hate what Jesus hates, right? That, that's what it looks like. And if you notice then, and it's in the exact same verse, it gives almost an explanation of what that type of love looks like. So an unhypocritical type of love, or love without hypocrisy, is a type of love that abhors what is evil and clings to what is good. Now, this actually flies in the face of what our culture teaches today because they would say that what love is, genuine, authentic love, is if you accept me for everything that I am and everything that I do and whatever I identify as. But no, that's not what he says. He says you are to love sincerely, and what that looks like is that you are actually going to abhor what is evil and you're going to cling to what is good. So if we want to have a a love like Christ, that means we are actually to have a love that clings to what is good or to cling to what is right. So that actually in, in ty, or that, um, implies then that our love must actually have truth in it, right? Love has to include what is good and what is true. And I think it's so cool if you just think about this for a second. He's talking about love, and then in the same verse, he says that you're also supposed to abhor what is evil. So that word abhor, literally what it means is hate. You are to hate what is evil. Now just, just think about this. So what we are talking about is true love hates evil. Isn't that weird to think about for a second, right? True love, what true love is, love hates. Isn't that interesting? It's just weird as I was thinking and and, and reflecting on that, but what true love looks like, it's we actually hate what is evil and we rejoice in what is good, what is is righteous. And so he's, he's really making this the emphasis for the Christian life. We are to have this type of love that is seeking after righteousness that would honor God. And I think then, as we go then to verse 10, it, he starts to explain how this type of love is supposed to be like a brotherly love, right? Which, because we are the body of Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ here. And he's saying that how this type of love is supposed to flow throughout the entire body. It actually, the way he almost describes it in, not only here, but in like 1 Corinthians when he talks about the body of Christ, it seems that he almost describes love as like this, um, the circulatory system, for the spiritual body, right? So if you think of all of us being members, right, we are all parts of the body that help, you know, honor and and build up one another. Love is like literally the circulatory system that allows us to continue to to flow, to to be healthy, and to to live in harmony together. So that's almost what he's kind of emphasizing here in verse 10 about how we are to um, have a love for one another, and then those spiritual gifts that we were talking about in verses 3 to 8, we are actually to exercise those but with love as our motivation. And if you actually then go to, or I'll, I'll read it for us, but you're welcome to turn there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you, you've probably heard this many times at weddings, right? This is the love chapter. But in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing." So this is how he starts out this love chapter, and he, and he actually is explaining some spiritual gifts, right? So if we just were looking in Romans chapter 12, how he was giving these other gifts that we, we could have, he basically says this, you could have all of these great spiritual gifts, but you can use them in an unspiritual way. So just because you have a spiritual gift, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to exercise it however you want. Rather, the whole point is that it's supposed to be flowing and motivated by a love for others. Right? And he actually he gives some really serious examples, right? So like if you can speak with the tongues of angels, right? That'd be a pretty cool thing, right? If you could speak the language of angels, I mean that's a pretty big deal. But he's saying, but if, if you're doing that and you don't have love, you're nothing. Not important at all. Basically, you're you're a loud noise, you're a clanging symbol. Basically, you're annoying, is what he's saying here. Now he goes on, he says, What about prophecy, right? Or if you have a lot of knowledge, here's another one. So you can be a smart teacher. You can actually know the Bible better than most people. But here's the thing, if you're preaching it or teaching it, but once again, if you're preaching to these people and you don't have love for them, then once again, you're nothing. If you don't have love, even if you're the smartest guy in the room, smartest girl in the room, once again, nothing. Or or faith that can move mountains, that's awesome. 
Could you imagine you have such faith in God that you could literally move a mountain? That's pretty amazing. I mean, most people, would, they would just focus on that gift. They're like, I want the gift that can levitate the mountains, right? He's saying, once again, you're nothing without love. And then, he, like I said, he just keeps going and giving these awesome examples of what we would think is awesome, right? And he, like I said, giving all your goods to the poor, we would think that's what love is, but he's showing that, no, you can do that and still not have love. Or you could even be burnt, giving your body and being burnt at the stake. And still, once again, if you don't have love. So he, he's really, Paul's making this in all of his letters how important it is for Christians to get this in their minds and in their hearts that we are to love one another. And we, it actually, he goes on and, and actually says that the way that we love is in, um, in honor or giving preference to one another. What, what he means by that is he is saying that we are to treat others more, as more important than ourselves. That's what real love looks like. That's what Jesus did, right? What does Jesus' life look like? It's a sacrificial life, right? We, we just said at the beginning, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We are to offer ourselves selflessly and sacrificially to one another rather than always thinking about what benefits us. And Paul, once again, so if you just think of another epistle that he wrote in Philippians chapter 2, Verses 1 to 4, listen to what he says here. He says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So that's what he's wanting to say here. A true biblical love like Christ, where we are working together as brothers and sisters, we are to elevate one another. We are look to make the other person look good and succeed. So like I said, the world is not like that. The world says, make yourself great. Build yourself up. Try to be as successful as possible and get as much followers as you want. But what we're saying is your goal, what true love looks like and what true biblical success looks like is, hey, you see the people in this room, the people that you see, notice how there's not a mirror in here. The people that you see, those are the ones that you're trying to make look good. That's what love looks like. You're trying to elevate them and have them succeed. So if we're wanting to outdo one another, as some of your translations might say, you are to outdo one another in showing honor. That's where we can be competitive, right? You guys want to be competitive spiritually? It's not about who can read or memorize the most Bible verses or who has the best singing voice, right? What it is is who is honoring and serving others better. That's why Jesus says those who are truly great are those who are the servants, right? So he's really emphasizing this, this, uh, this, um, zeal or this desire for us to have love for one another. And then he says not only then do we get it in our heads, right, which I'm sure you hear this, right? I know one of our, our sayings whenever you hear every Sunday morning is we are committed to loving God and loving others and making disciples. We say that a lot, right? But what he says is don't just hear it and do it today. But then he, in verses 11 to 13, he actually admonishes his readers to maintain their spiritual zeal, right? So he says don't just hear I'm called to love my neighbor, I'm called to love my brother and my sister, and you do it whenever it's convenient or you do it for a couple days and then you get cold, because right? anyone can do something for a couple days. But he's saying, I want you to re- remember this. You are called to not allow your zeal to run dry or, or for your spiritual zeal to, to, to waver. Rather, you are to continue to serve others. And then he actually explains why we are to do that. It's because ultimately, this is you serving the Lord. That's what he says there. He's saying, all going back to the very beginning of chapter 12, this is what it looks like to serve God. So if you really want to honor God and if you want to serve him and show him, Lord, I love you, you have to do these type of things for your brothers and sisters. You have to love them like Christ loves the church so that that will be an honorable and acceptable um, sacrifice for God. And I think it's important then that we we hear that we're called to do these things. We're called to maintain our spiritual zeal. And and it says not lagging in diligence, but fervent in the spirit, right? Right. And and he says this because I think as we start to truly do this, right, if you really start to love one another, you you see what it will do to the body. It will bring the body true health. You you know what it's like if you ever are around a group of people that really just love one another? 
right? And really enjoy one another's company and really build one another up, point them towards the Lord. You know what it's like to be in that room. It's, it's somewhere you, you could stay for hours, right? Maybe you've been in that place where you just have people that you just love and that, you know, they love you and support you. Well, whenever we have this going on in our, in our community, what we see is that actually when we are serving Christ and serving one another, what we see is that usually is going to lead to satanic opposition. Because here's the thing, Satan doesn't like whenever you're doing exactly what you're called to do. He doesn't want you to love one another. He doesn't want you to serve one another. He doesn't want you to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Rather, what he wants you to do is to bicker. He wants you to gossip. He wants you to tear down rather than build up. So on a Sunday morning after you've had a service of worship, what he wants you to do is he wants you to go to lunch and he wants you to pick out all of the bad things that just happened and how this person really gets on your nerves and how this person didn't show up and how this person did this, right? That's exactly what Satan wants. You, you see satanic opposition. And if you just look at the book of Acts that we've been working through on Sundays, right? How many times when you see Paul or others, they are faithfully serving God and serving others and, and preaching the gospel, do you, immediately you see opposition, trying to make him quiet, trying to imprison him, trying to stone him, trying to kill him. Why? It's because Satan hates whenever we get it right. He, he does not want us to hear this chapter and apply this chapter. And if you ever notice that maybe you're not feeling or seeing a lot of opposition in your life, it's probably because you're not doing what we see in this chapter. Because here's the thing, Satan loves it if you aren't doing it, and he's not going to bother you. So if you're ever thinking, well, I don't do this, and my life's going great. Yeah, it's probably because Satan wants you to feel very comfortable in your prison cell. That's not what we are called to do. We're called to love one another, and you'll expect then that there will be things that happen. And so if you notice, then he starts to list these things that we're called to do so that we do not lose this diligence or this zeal to love for one another. And he actually says we are to rejoice in hope. He's wanting to encourage, encourage us to rejoice because with satanic opposition and with trials and with times of, of discouragement, we are still called to rejoice in hope, to have a hope in Christ. And it says we are to be patient in tribulation. Not if there's going to be tribulation. He knows there will be tribulation. You are to be patient, steadfast in it. And then it says that you are to continue steadfastly in prayer. See, he understood that once they hear this love piece and they get it right, he knows what's going to become knocking at the door, and he says, and I want you to remember these things now. I want you to remember to, to rejoice, to have hope, to be patient, and to be in prayer. We are to be in prayer. That is an ongoing, continual conversation with our hearts and God. Right? We are to be in relationship and in a conversation with God, and that is how we can maintain this love for him and love for one another. And then finally, in verse 13, it says, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. And so what we're seeing here is that we are, are not only called to serve Christ and to serve one another, but we are to share in burdens and blessings with one another. So that is how we grow together and that is how we glorify the Lord. We actually share in each other's burdens and blessings. Now I wonder, think about your relationship with the body of Christ and do you see yourself doing those two things? Are you sharing in the burdens? So you hear your brother or sister, they're struggling, they're, they're dealing with something going on in life. Are you that person that is, is reaching out to them, trying to help them get through it, encouraging them? Right? Are you, and also, are you, if you're ever struggling yourself, are you, are you reaching out and saying, hey, brother, I need you? Right? I need some support. I need some encouragement. I have a question. I, I need to talk this through. Are you sharing in the burdens? Likewise, in the blessings, right? That can go back to the spiritual gifts that we talked about, right? Whatever good things are happening, are, are we using those to bless one another? And are we, you know, encouraging when we see the good things happening? Are we wanting to continue to encourage that and see that um, continue to be manifested within the body? So I think that that's what he's saying here when it's talking about um, giving hospitality or meeting needs. It, it's carrying one another's burdens and blessing one another with our gifts, so I think that this kind of gives us a, a really good um, context then for as we move into verses 14 to 21. So if we just think about once again, we're living like Christ. The first part is we got to get loving like Christ, right? And then that's going to motivate what we're going to do next in verses 14 to 21. And that is to make peace like Christ. Because though we love people and though we love God and though we might do our very best sometimes, 
for there to be peace, there's going to be times where there won't be peace, right? There's going to be things where we have enemies. There's going to be um, individuals that don't like us. And so if you look and notice in verse 14, he actually says very, you know, that very thing. He says, bless those who persecute you. So, I mean, that should sound really familiar if you know Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? Because in Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. See, Paul, he experienced this. He knew Jesus experienced this where people persecuted him, right? They reviled him. They mocked him. They, they said all types of evil against him and, and, and made false claims about him. But he's saying, with all of this going on, I want you to remember first, the first part, which is to love others. And this is not only going to be the body of Christ, but now he's explaining that it's actually going to be also loving your enemies. And not only are you just to say, yes, we love all people and we don't really do anything with it. He's actually saying you are to actually actively bless them. And Jesus gives us clarity of what that would look like, right? As we see, he says that you are to bless them, and then he says you are to pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So I just want you to think about that now in your context. Are there people that you would probably think of as my enemy, or someone who maybe you don't get along with very well, or maybe someone that hates you, or, or makes fun of you, or gossips, or, or, or does anything, or maybe there's someone in your past that has hurt you, right? I want you to think about if there's anyone like that in your world, and if not great, you're blessed at this moment, right? But there's probably someone that has hurt you in your life. And what he's saying is, I want you to bless them. I want you to pray for them. He says, I want you to let go of the pain, let go of the hurt, stop being a part of the reason why there's division. And he says, I want you to actually bless them. And blessing was a big thing, especially in the Old Testament, because blessing would be literally, you want them to prosper, right? A father would like bless his child and give him a, sp a special blessing, right? So he's saying, I actually want you to bless your enemies or bless those who, who persecute you. And then it's interesting in verses 15 to 16, then he kind of talks about how we are to um, do some things. It's weird. Like you said, you wouldn't necessarily think of it with the verse before it because he's talking about blessing those who persecute you. And then he goes right into something that you wouldn't, I, at least I wouldn't think right away, would be the next thought. And he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But I, what I think he's saying here is actually this is how you're going to win over your enemies, I think. Whenever you can empathize with others, and that's empathizing with your brother and sister in Christ, but also empathizing with the lost or, or the unsaved or your enemy. Because think about this, if you can see your enemy and those who are actually going against you, and if you can actually empathize with them and actually kind of understand what they're going through because usually hurt people hurt people right it's not people that are co completely healthy and sustained they aren't the ones that are really lashing out it's the people that are actually broken inside themselves those are the ones that are actually hurting people see now if you can actually kind of have that mindset like christ look at this individual and say this enemy of mine needs jesus actually and you can actually then start to see whenever they have successes and they're rejoicing you can actually rejoice with them. You can actually see, as I'm praying for them to succeed, and you see that it happens, and they rejoice, you can actually rejoice. Likewise, if they're mourning, don't be rejoicing at that point for them. Mourn with them. Actually show that you care. Have compassion on them. And, and just, can you imagine, and actually it's going to go into this, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself in the chapter, but just imagine if your enemy, who does all these evils against you, and all of a sudden, they just lost a loved one or, or they just lost their job or, or something just blew up in their face. And you go over and say, hey, I just wanted to check on you and see if you're all right. I just want to let you know I love you. I've been praying for you. Could you just imagine what that would look like or what that would do to someone that's hurting at that moment? See, I think that's what he's actually getting at. That's why I think it actually says bless those who persecute you. And the very next thing he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. He's saying, there are people that are hurt, people that are going to lash out, and there's going to be all types of good and bad, mourning and rejoicing, but empathize and have compassion on other people. Try to reconcile. Try to bring good out of even bad, messy situations. And, and so then that's really kind of the um, moving, as I said, I got a little ahead, but in verses 17 to 18, he then goes on and basically says that very thing. We are not to return evil for evil. 
we actually are to return good for evil. Right? That means whenever someone does something that's wrong against you, you are not to retaliate. You are not to avenge yourself. Rather, you are to say, you did something wrong, I was wronged here, and I could give you justice, but what I, instead I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you mercy, I'm going to give you forgiveness, and I'm actually going to give you return good to you. See, that's hard. That's not, that's not what the world wants. You know, anyone can return good for good, and anyone can return evil for evil, right? And I know all of us have done that, right? Someone that's good to you, says a, an encouraging word, gives you a gift, right? All those things, we can do that. Someone's nice to you, you're nice back. That's 101, getting along, right? Likewise, evil for evil. Someone does something bad to you, you always want to get even, right? That's my first thought. Is I, or at least I want to like make sure that they know that I'm elevated above them, even if I'm not actually going to lash out physically, right? It might be like, I just want to get that upper righteous standard on them, right? Like, I'm a little bit holier than you, right? Christians do this. Don't act like we don't, right? See, He's saying, don't be like the world. Don't do what is easy. Rather, we are called to Christ's standard. Right? Remember this. It's not, oh, well, everybody else does it. You're lowering the bar. You're lowering the standard. The standard is Christ. Christ is perfect. So your standard is perfection. Now, we obviously know we don't ever get there. That's why Christ died, right? That's why we rejoice in the gospel, because Christ covered us when we fail. But that's still what we're striving for, right? We are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. That's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. So we, we, we hear this and we are called then to return good for the evil that happens in our lives. And, and as I said, though harmony with others, it might not always be achievable, right? And that's why he does say here that as much as depends on you. Because here's the thing, you could do everything right, and even when they wrong you, you return good, and there's still going to be people that are not going to accept it, right? There were people that no matter what Jesus did, didn't like him. Remember, Jesus was crucified. Now, he is the ultimate peacemaker, right? He is the prince of peace, but even he ended up being killed by his persecutors. So we need to be careful and, and make sure that when we're saying we want to find peace, we want to make peace, we want to um, show other people love and, and goodness towards them even when they give us evil, we do have to recognize that there will be times where it's just not going to happen. It's not achievable on this side because there's people that have hardened hearts and are, don't know the Lord. And, but I still think that we're still reminding ourselves that we still hear this call in Matthew 5, 9. And that's, once again, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So if you want to be a son or a daughter of God, you are to be a peacemaker. And, and I've said this, and I'll say it almost every time I probably read this verse. It's a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. It's so easy to keep peace. Once again, that's good for good. We're saying peacemaker, that's good for evil, right? We're actually introducing goodness, righteousness, Christ into the situation when maybe he's not in the situation, right? So, so we are to do these things and we are called to be peacemakers. And, and I do want to say there is a difference too whenever we say, when we preach the gospel and we pre, uh, pe uh, if I can say it, preach the offense of the cross, right? Because the gospel is offensive. So this is where we have to remember it's as much as we can possibly do to alleviate the offense. We are to preach the gospel, and it will offend people because the gospel says you have sinned against God. And people don't like to hear you're a sinner. People don't like to hear you need to repent. You need to change your life. You need to change your mind. You need to trust in Jesus. So though we are called to do that, we are not to be unnecessarily offensive, right? So let the cross be offensive. You as a Christian don't be offensive. So that's what he's getting at. Be a peacemaker as much as depends on you, but still preach the gospel message because that's where true peace with God comes. So, so he's been, as, he, as we've been looking at verses 14 to 21, how we're, we're, we're thinking about making peace like Christ. We've seen that we are to bless those who persecute us. We see we are to empathize with others, that is believers and non-believers. We are to return good for evil. And then the final thing in verses 19 to 21 that he says to be a peacemaker is he says you are to give place to wrath. And he actually quotes Deuteronomy 32, 35, which says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand and the things to come hasten upon them. Now, what we see here 
is interesting because we're actually said you are not to retaliate, right? We've already said that, right? You're not supposed to return evil uh, for evil, right? You're not supposed to do bad. You're supposed to bring good. But it actually goes even further now, and it actually emphasizes it, and it actually says you are to give place or to put away your wrath, put away your anger, not hold on to it, and actually you're supposed to say, I trust it to God. God literally says vengeance is mine, now, just imagine now if you retaliate, which I, like I said, we've all done this. When you retaliate, you know what you were telling God? Maybe not, you know, in your own, you're not maybe intentionally thinking this, right? But literally what you're saying is, God, vengeance is mine. Say, God, I'm actually taking over this situation. God, I'm taking something that is rightfully yours as the king and judge of the universe. So it's actually more than just, hey, this is a good thing to do. This is actually going to cultivate more love and maybe win over people to Christ. It's actually saying we're disobeying and rebelling against God if we retaliate. That's pretty serious. So we need to, we need to think about this as not only is it a good moral lesson, but it's actually going to affect our relationship with God if we try to take vengeance ourselves, right? So we are not to take it. We are to recognize that God is the one who will make all things right. Now, by the way, that's so much better. Do you not want God to take vengeance on those who need vengeance? Do you not want him to be the, the true judge that will do what is right? Seriously, anything you do is not going to be near as good as what God's going to do. God's going to bring righteousness to the earth, right? Righteousness is being revealed through this book. It's being revealed through the Bible. So anything we try to do to try to get even with someone, retaliate, really you're just stepping on God's toes and you're doing something that's not going to be near as good as what God could do. So he then says that, Rather than um, doing what we see here is we are to give place to wrath, and it actually says that you're supposed to do what we saw with Jesus saying, you are to love your enemy, and he gives some practical examples here, which a lot of people, Christians today, they probably wouldn't even do this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Is that something you're willing to do if you had that person that was maybe on your mind earlier? Are you willing to feed them, give them something to drink? meet a need that they have, that's what true discipleship, that's what true love, that's what a peacemaker is. It's someone that's willing to do that. And then it actually goes on and says, for in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I've actually read some Christian commentators differ on what that actually means. He's quoting here Proverbs 25, uh, verses 21 to 22, about the, the coals of fire on their head. And, and I've seen some that think it's like a good thing, like you actually are going to maybe, that'll lead to their conversion, so maybe the coals are somehow defi um, defining like, or describing their like being purified, right, being made whole, or like Isaiah, he had a coal touch his mouth. So some think that maybe this is saying this leads to their conversion if you do this. And then others think, well, actually, we think more so it might be putting them to shame. So you're actually openly, you know, putting them to shame whenever they're doing all this wickedness, and then you still love and serve them anyway. I think it's possible it could be a, maybe a little bit of both. It could be that whenever you see someone treating someone like trash or garbage, and then they continue to love and serve them, and you look at the two, who are you think is going to be, oh, this one's the one we respect, and this is the one that we don't think too highly of, right? So it is going to actually put them to shame, but once again, it also could really lead them to Christ. It really could lead to their purification. So it's interesting how he says this with the coals of fire, but he ends with um, how we are, this final challenge, which really I think kind of summarizes this whole section then, is it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, with good. And I think that is our, that is our challenge, to, to love like Christ, to make peace like Christ, to live like Christ, is to do this very thing. It's to not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. That's what we're called to do. And like I said, the, it's so easy for us to read this, but it can be difficult often for us to practice it. But this is what we're called to. And I think that the church would do so much better if we literally would commit chapter 12 to memory. And if we would actually try to practice this and live this out daily, but that we would overcome evil that we would not be overcome by it. Because there's that also, there's that, it says do not be overcome by it. So what does that mean? You, you could, if you, if you ch choose to, if you want to let evil reign in your heart, it can happen. So he's saying do not let it happen, but overcome it with good. So that is with the gospel, that is with Christ, that is with his love, and that is with um, his call for us to be peacemakers.